Uh, I'm Sumit Kulati. I'm from the Land and Food, uh, Faculty of Land and Food Systems. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to welcome the Honorable uh, Herb Dhaliwal here. Uh, before I start off on telling you about his illustrious career, first thing I want to say is that Herb is also an alma mater of UBC. So we can sort of share in the pride of his illustrious career. Uh, and he's back here to tell us about it. What I'll, what I'll explain in a few minutes. So Herb uh, was the senior, then he was Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, and then uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, with the special responsibility for British Columbia. And, uh, and Herb presided over some really challenging files in his, in his long career uh, in the federal government. Some of them included uh, uh, issues around climate change, uh, <coughs> the topic of fisheries rights to Aboriginal, Communities in Atlantic Canada. He also uh, he, he was uh, presiding over uh, issues around international fisheries, nuclear energy, the Mackenzie Valley pipeline, and uh, like I said, climate change. But despite these uh, all these big challenges that he had and, and the big files that he dealt with, he said that his most challenging and most rewarding file was the one that he's going to tell us uh, today about, the one where he had to struggle to get uh, fishing rights to the Aboriginal communities of uh, Atlantic Canada. So without any further ado, uh can, I turn this on? Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, I can remember when the campus was much smaller when I went to here many, many years ago. It seems to spread out all the time, but uh, it's great to see uh, you here today. I thought it'd be good, first of all, for me to comment on some of the current issues that are in existence, and then talk about uh, one of the toughest files I had to deal with minister as a minister, but one of the most rewarding files that I had to deal with, which is a Marshall decision, and uh, I'll explain that part of it later on. Uh, first of all, I don't know if you have read recently four former fisheries ministers had written to the government on the changes to the Fisheries Act recently. Uh, and that we, did, we disagreed with the process and as well as the actual changes to the Fisheries Act, uh, which will result in a substantial reduction in providing habitat, both in terms of the funding that's been cut as well as the legislation that's changed. And I think what uh, what concerned me the most, and I'm, I mean, I'm not in politics, so none of this is political. It's really about uh, having been a fisheries minister and responsible for my concern for the environment, for the fisheries, and where you take a piece of legislation, which is under the Fisheries Act, and it, which which has been there for you know over a hundred years, one of the oldest acts we have. And uh, instead of going through the normal parliamentary process, which is any new act that comes forward, if it's under the Fisheries Act, the Minister of Fisheries introduces it into the House of Commons. There's a very good reason for that, because the Fisheries Minister is responsible for the en enactment of that uh, act. And therefore, if you want to make changes to the Fisheries Act, you have to, uh, to the normal process. The Fisheries Minister tables it in the House, it gets debated in the House, it goes to the Committee of Parliament, who then ask people to submit scientists, uh, people involved in policy, uh, other non-government organizations or uh, individuals who have it to come forward to the Parliamentary Committee, and they have an opportunity to look at what they say and then make adjustments to that, and then and justify it. And then it gets a full debate in Parliament as well. So to have it put in a, in a, in a budget is, uh, I think, uh, very concerning for people like myself who have the opportunity to serve as, as fisheries uh, minister. The other, so that, that is one debate. The other debate all of you have known now is uh, very current in people's mind is the pipeline, which is getting a lot of press. And I was involved in those big files, you know, the Mackenzie Valley pipeline, because as minister of response under natural resources, also pipeline was an important issue. And it all also wrapped up in climate change. And I remember sitting with uh, some of the CEOs of the biggest corporations, of the pipelines, of the oil, <coughs> people like Suncor, all these people, and, and talking to them about climate change and how important it is for the global community 
to, to make sure that we play our part uh, as a country and, and actually take a leadership role. And uh, you know, the corporate leaders, particularly in Alberta, who refused to take part in fact, they said they do everything possible to fight uh, climate change and uh, that uh, you know, it was a flawed science, uh, it wasn't their responsibility, most of the carbon emissions uh, uh, caused by automobiles and that's why you should focus your attention. And, uh, and just looking back at what their feeling was then to fight us as a government, if we were going to move on climate change with all their resources to now they're saying this is one of the single issue uh, challenges they have is playing a role in climate change. And we were telling them at that time that you're going to have to deal with this issue. And now with a keystone pipeline, a big part of that is Obama is watching what we're going to do as a country on climate change. And there's a lot of pressure from environmentalists and others uh, to say, you know, Canada is producing all these uh, carbon emissions from the oil sands, and uh, yet they want to put this pipeline. So it's all wrapped up. It's not really about the pipeline itself. It's all about Canada's uh, role in climate change and what we're doing in our response to that. So it's interesting to see how the corporate community, from saying we're going to fight this now to saying that this is an issue that they have to deal with. The only thing is they've been fighting it for so many years, but there's a huge thing to change. And I think that uh, that's what Obama and are watching on what's going to happen on the climate change issue. The other areas which I was very active in as fisheries minister was the migratory and straddling stocks. It's part of my responsibility as fisheries minister, not only to have a sustainable fishery for Canada, but internationally uh, to play a role in, in protecting our oceans, uh, protecting the mammals, which, you know, we've got a huge problem in the oceans of overfishing. Uh, and part of that, part of my job was to help us as a country take a lead role. And the straddling stock and migratory stock was a major accomplishment for which Canada took a leadership role in protecting those stocks that swim out of the 200 mile zone, come in or straddle it, and have a regime, an international regime, to try to help to protect that. And once again, uh, it's, it's about protecting the oceans and uh, protecting uh, uh, you know, the, the fisheries resources. So Canada has been playing a leading role in this area. Unfortunately, recently, it's, uh, it's not. It's uh, losing some of its stature and the leadership roles play on the environment, uh, protecting our oceans, and developing a sustainable fishery, which, which some like to stop disappointing. Now, as a, I was appointed to cabinet as the fisheries minister in 1999 uh, by the prime minister, and often uh, people say, well, what the heck does Herb Dallow know about fisheries? He's never been involved in the fishing industry, and, and uh, articles saying, well, why did you appoint this person? And I think people have this view as well that a minister, should he have some expertise in those areas? And, and generally, ministers don't have an expertise because usually they have you know, a huge number of uh, uh, bureaucrats and officials who are supposed to have the, the expertise to advise the minister. And so you find it's not the case that ministers are, have expertise. I know when I, uh, the Prime Minister called me up and I was uh, in Morocco and said, um, Herb, can you be my fisheries minister? And I said, Prime Minister, you got the wrong Herb, you should be looking for Herb Gray. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work, so he made me come back to Ottawa and I was sworn in as a fish, fisheries minister, uh, fisheries and ocean minister in 1999. So this was summer of 1999. And I was just getting to know the portfolio, and of course, uh, after you become a minister, you take on huge uh, binders every night, and uh, you're reading through them and to develop this expertise to make decisions. And then, in uh, I believe in September, October of 1999, we had this thing called the Marshall decision, and it was Marshall One, Marshall Two. Marshall One, Marshall Two was a Supreme Court ruling in which. Donald Marshall was fishing for eels uh, and uh, was charged for fishing outside the fisheries regulation without a license. And through the lower courts, all the ruling was, uh, yes, it was illegal. It went to the Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court went back to a treaty called the Peace and Friendship Treaty signed by the British in 1760, 1761 with a big 
Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet people, uh, the First Nations, and the courts ruled that under that treaty, uh, the Maliseet and the Mi'kmaq people, this is on the East Coast, have a right to the fishery for to earn a moderate livelihood. Uh, so the uh, the Supreme Court really did have no idea how the fisheries uh, are managed. All they did is they went to the friendship and peace treaty that existed, which clearly stated, and I, 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 there's lots of treaties that the British signed at other places as well, like uh, in my ancestral area of the state of Punjab, a piece of friendship treaty that the British signed also probably in the late 1700s, which was to buy peace and, 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 and make sure that uh, they could operate in those areas. And I presume that's the basis that the British signed that. Uh, so here was a Supreme Court ruling which said that the uh, Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet First Nations have a right to the fishery for commercial purposes to be able to fish for a modern livelihood. Now, this created, created huge havoc in the whole industry. Why? Because, uh, as you know, the fisheries operate where they develop a total allowable catch. And that catch is divided. People have licenses. And so you have a limited supply. And so the Supreme Court ruling came up. And now, uh, just to give you an idea, is uh, this is the cartoon the media came up. It says, needless, needless to say, the court position caught us well off guard. And it shows uh, myself with uh, my pants holding down, <laughs> with underwear with all these fish. So uh, it sort of shows that what happened was, uh, and the, there was a lot of media coverage throughout this time in this whole area, but the government not, not really prepared for this ruling. And to some extent, they were right, but it was very difficult to predict. Nobody could have predicted that someone who's charged with catching eels uh, would result in a major decision of the Supreme Court to recognize that there was a right under the treaty for the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people. Uh, but it just it, it, it illustrates that as a government, uh, we really didn't have a response because nobody knew that this would be this would be something that would happen because the lower courts all supported the government. <laughs> so now you have a situation uh, where the Supreme Court has ruled this. What does the government do? You know, and the government always has these set of options. You know, option one, um, one option two, option three. And so uh, people were very much afraid of this situation and thought this was going to cause social unrest. And so you have this situation, just to explain it. You have the commercial fishery. Most of them were you know, non-Aboriginal. They had a license to fish. We had a regulated fishery, which we had regulations. And now you had the Supreme Court ruling saying, now the, the, the First Nations have a right to fish. The commercial fishermen were saying, well, no way we're going to allow someone else to come and fish because we have a license, we have a quota. And if they come out and fish, they're hurting our livelihood. So uh, we had the commercial fishermen up in arms. You had on the other side, the Aboriginal community, say, well, finally our right is being recognized that we've been saying for the last 250 years. The Supreme Court has finally recognized our right, and this right says we can go and fish. For commercial purpose, we can fish what we want, how much we want, when we want, because that's what this right says. So they've interpreted that they're able to now go and do it as freely as possible. So uh, I was a minister responsible to try to get this done. And the first thing is when you have a ruling of this nature, the minister himself or herself cannot take action. You have to work with the justice minister, with the minister of Aboriginal Affairs, with the finance minister, all these things. So it's not like I could all of a sudden respond to this. It required a governmental response. And uh, all the other ministers had to be in sight. So even though the media were very critical of, uh, of a lack of response, the governments just don't work as quickly. In fact, 
I think we responded much more quickly because there were drivers in government. You have to have drivers who drive the government. The drivers here was the Supreme Court and, uh, and what was happening, the social unrest that was developing uh, in Atlantic Canada where uh, they were seeing that there was going to be tremendous social unrest, that there was going to be fights, people may get killed, people were going to get hurt, there was property damage. And of course that, that brings the media out as well because the media will, will be out there covering every part of it because uh, they see that it's going to be a huge sensation. So here was the government had this ruling, and then there were people who were saying, giving advice. There was no shortage of advice given to me as, as a minister as to what I could do. The opposition with uh, Mr. Cummins, who's now the leader of the Conservative Party, he would stand up in the House and say that we have to use a notwithstanding clause, Minister. You must use a notwithstanding clause of the Constitution because this will never work. It'll be chaos in the fisheries. There'll be tremendous social unrest. The commercial official would never accept this. You have to use a notwithstanding clause, was the, was the view of Mr. Cummins, who was then the critic of the opposition. Now, then some of my own colleagues were very much afraid of this. And they were getting pressure from their commercial fishermen. And, you know, if you're, if you're from Atlantic Canada, the fisheries is huge compared to Western Canada. Because this is their livelihood. Whole communities are built on the fisheries. So they were saying, you have to go back to court and ask for a stay of proceedings because you're not going to be able to do this. It's not going to happen. It's going to be too many. So, so I was faced uh, with these challenges. I rejected both those views, both the notwithstanding clause, which I, which I didn't believe in at all, and the staying, uh, going back to court, the Supreme Court and asked for a stay of proceedings. The reason was that because, you know, someone, the First Nations, after 250 years, got a ruling that they believed in, and now to go back to them and say, oh, by the way, we're going to go back to the Supreme Court as a government, and try to <coughs> delay this or try to use some other ways to stop us from enforcing it. So I rejected it, and I even went as far as saying that if we ever used the notwithstanding clause, that I would resign as Minister of Fisheries that it was not in the best interest of, of Canada. And uh, so we rejected both those options. And then we moved to say, well, how can we respond to this uh, with the First Nations? And so one of the things we had to do is build trust with the First Nations. And so one of the things I did is I went to what they call the APC, the Atlantic Policy Congress, where all the chiefs in the Atlantic region met, and I spent a full day listening to them, each chief, uh, for a full day. And the media was there. We tried to get an agreement saying that, you know, we have to fish within the regulation, that we as a government will have a response, but I needed their cooperation to work together, that this is going to take time, it's not something that can be done overnight, that this needs to make sure that we work together. Well, it, it, uh, at first they agreed, but then it broke down and then people went out and started to fish. Commercial fishermen uh, said they're going to they're gonna get out and get their guns and shoot at people. I mean, it was very tense. I mean, you could have people shooting each other and, and all that. And one of the worries for me as a minister is you didn't want these communities scarred for life where there was violence and, and, uh, and, and people could die scar in the community. So it was a real problem as a government. It's not only about what we're going to do, but also deal with two uh, groups of people that, that, that could collide together. And so uh, one of the things was try to win the cooperation of the First Nations group. Said, we're going to respond to that. We're going to make sure we give you access to the fishery. We're going to integrate the fishery, but we need your cooperation to, to give us time to develop the programs that are needed to make this happen. Uh, but it was a very tense time. Uh, it was extremely difficult. And uh, I was able to get success on getting cooperation out of the 27 bands out of 34. But two or three, Burnt Church was one of them. And that's what got all the media because there was some violence there. Uh, trucks were set on fire. And uh, they, said, they said, their basic view was, we don't care what you say 
Minister, do we have a right to the fishery? And we figure the Supreme Court ruling gives us the ability to go out and fish what we want, when we want, how we want, how much we want, and you have you have no way of doing it. Now, all of a sudden the Supreme Court also saw what was happening out there. They realized that they really didn't have an understanding of how the fisheries are managed. They didn't have a clue what the effect would be. So they came back, which is rarely ever done in the Supreme Court. They had a clarification of Marshall One, which is referred to as Marshall Two. Which is to say, as the minister, you know, the right is subjected to the law of the land and fisheries regulations. And, and that the minister, as fisheries, does have the right to manage the fishery in the best interest of everyone in a sustainable way. Because otherwise, it would be chaos. If everybody could fish whatever they want, there'd be no more fish for anybody. Fish resource wouldn't be there. So you have to have uh, controls, you have to have regulations, you have to have proper management. Fisheries. Uh, so then we were we started a process, and one of the things was, as a minister, you got these warring groups, and, and you're trying to make sure that we don't have violence in our society. And so I also went to the commercial fishermen, and some of them were extreme right wing, saying we should bring in the military minister, we should stop these people from fishing illegally, and you have to stop them, otherwise we're going to take the law into our own hands. This was some of the response of the commercial fishermen. If you don't regulate the fishery, we're going to do it ourselves. So I remember having to call the head of the RCMP and head of the CSIS and, and, uh, and informing them that they have to be there, they have to make sure they protect the citizen and they, we need their support where we can. And uh, so we had cooperation from 27 when we said we're going to work with you. We hired a federal representative who's going to be with every ban and see how we can we can involve them in the fishery. Now this requires a lot of money because as you all know, we've allocated the quotas to everyone. So the pie cannot be expanded. How do you expand the pie to bring in new people? It's already divvied up in the commercial fishery. So we had to come up with a plan on how do we integrate the First Nations to the fishery. And my first battle as a cabinet was to get the funds because the only way you're going to provide new entrants into it is to buy existing licenses, buy existing capacity. And that required a lot of money. So I, as minister, went to my cabinet uh, colleagues. We had a proposal on the table. And we never publicly released this figure, but I think it's probably out there now. It was about over $700 million that I needed to implement, in a, which I felt in an adequate way to a response to Marshall. And uh, as you can understand, it's not that easy to go to your colleagues to get 700 or 750 million dollars for this process. So, uh, and they have a thing in Ottawa called the Centre. Every minister is very much aware of the Centre. The Centre is the Privy Council, it's the Prime Minister's office, it's the Treasury Board, it's the Finance. If you can't bring those levers together, you can't make decisions. And so what happened was, uh, I wanted to go to, there's two committees of cabinet. One is called social union, one is called economic union. So I was going to go to one of the social economic units to present my budget, present what I needed as a response to Marshall. And lo and behold, I was told, oh, you're not going to go to that subcommittee of cabinet, that committee of cabinet, you're going to go to an ad hoc committee of cabinet. This is something the Prime Minister used to do if there was a real problem in one area. He would set up an ad hoc committee of cabinet of only a small group of ministers to deal with urgent matters that need to be dealt with. And so, but what happened was the ministers that were on that ad hoc committee were, I know ministers who are extremely difficult to get money from. Mm -hmm. And they were not going to allow to give me a budget of 700 or 750 million dollars to do a response. And so what happens is when they make a decision, it's almost final, it's very difficult to go back and change it. So I did something which was very rarely done, I guess, in St. Paul's. I refused to attend that meeting uh, because I said in the national interest that we need to go to the full social committee of cabinet because it's such an important decision for Canada. And so I refused uh, to attend until such time that I got a full agreement from 
Prime Minister's office that that would only be an information meeting, and not a decision making meeting. And no decision would be made at that meeting because I think it was very rare that ministers didn't attend meetings, even though I had a call from the Chief of Staff saying, I expect you to be at that meeting. And I said, no, it's, it's too, too important interest of the country to leave it to a few ministers for such a major issue. So I was able to win over agreement not to uh, have a decision made in ad hoc committee, because I knew what would have happened in my, my response. My request for $750 million most likely would have been down to $300 million, and I think we would have not adequately responded to our commitment uh, to Marshall and the Supreme Court ruling. So then it was left to, um, at the end of the day, myself and the, normally if you can work out with the finance minister, then the, uh, that doesn't, you still have to be approval of the social committee, but they'll accept that. So we had a big fight with Paul Martin. I, uh, I told him that this is our, our, our opportunity to help the most marginalized Canadians, to improve their life, to integrate them in the fishery, and we have to do it properly, and we have to have the resources to do that. And so, after a, a, a lot of a noisy meeting, I'm sure there's a lot of loud banging and all that in the desk, after I had a meeting with him, and uh, a lot of arm twisting, he agreed, and we had a package in the neighborhood of, I think, 700 to $750 million to respond to the Marshall decision. And what that meant now was, I mean, from my point of view, we wanted the first entity to be successful in the fishery. We wanted them to continue to earn money from the fishery and have economic development and be successful in the fishery. So we hired a guy named Mackenzie, who was then started working with each first nation to start saying, what can we do in the fishery? We're going we're gonna to make sure you have boats. We're going to make sure you have licenses. We're going to make sure you have training. We're going to make sure you have mentoring. And we'll do it on an incremental basis over a five-year period of time. And, uh, and we started that program. Unfortunately, not all the bands were willing to uh, participate or cooperate. Three bands, I think it was uh, Burnt Church and two others, said, we don't care. We're going to go out and fish. Now, I had a very tough position as a minister because my responsibility was to make sure that we have a regulated and orderly fishery. And this would equate chaos in the whole Atlantic region. So one of the, one of the toughest decisions I've made, and uh, you'll see some slides here, was to send in the enforcement. Uh, okay, well before we send that, this will maybe go back. Uh, before we went to, one of the decisions I had to make is, can, should I send our enforcement people in to arrest those people who are fishing? And but before I did that, I mean, on, on the on the eve of that decision, I uh, agreed for Bob Ray, who was now the leader of the opposition, the Liberals, to go in and try to get a deal with those three bands that refused to operate under the regulations. And uh, even though it was. Uh, something I didn't want to do, but I felt we have to give every chance to have a resolution peaceful. That we have to take every avenue to make sure we can resolve the situation without violence, without anybody being hurt. Because the last thing you want is a, as a federal minister to make a decision that someone gets hurt. And so, I, uh, Bob Ray, who is a very well-known, respected individual, went in and tried to get an agreement. This is what this cartoon reflects with, with Bob Ray in the middle trying to get a resolution uh, under very difficult circumstances, uh, under tense situations, trying to get an agreement. And myself, on the other hand, uh, being the person who carries out the law, this is a DFO ramble. So it, uh, it, it sort of portrays what the thinking of that time was. This was a very tense situation. Unfortunately, regrettably, Bob Ray could not get an agreement with uh, two or three for bands that refused, and then I had to send in the enforcement people, which was a very difficult decision to do. I think it was the next line. Uh, 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 lots of cartoons. Yeah, this is sort of, the, once again, shows me in, in, in the many faces of her. Uh, 
they try to deal with this issue. But so what happened, Bob Ray couldn't do it. I had a very tough decision. And this is classic. When you say the buck stops at your desk, well, this is the stuff that stops on the minister's desk because I had to make a tough decision on arresting people and charging people for not obeying the regulations. Yeah, this is probably the one with the, with the shark. So when I went in and uh, arrested people, uh, there was all these cartoons showing me as a, as a shark. Uh, there's Herb and this is the, the, uh, the Aboriginal fishery at, at me arresting. So this is all about when I said we have to we have to go in and make sure we abide by the law. Now, the reason this was a tough decision, obviously, because we didn't want anybody hurt, we didn't want anybody injured. Uh, but at the same time, I could not, as a minister, allow people to fish outside the law. So we had a very difficult meeting, and uh, my deputy minister, who is now the clerk of the Privy Council, Wayne Waters, and secretary to cabinet, was my deputy minister. So I instructed uh, my deputy minister that if there is fishing going on that's uh, not under the regulation against, I want you to arrest those people who charge them. It's one of the toughest decisions I made uh, as a minister. And uh, uh, he was not interested in doing, doing, in doing that. So he would say, well, minister, you know, I, I can't do that. I, I don't think we should do this for this industry. So I said the second time, no, I want you to make sure that we carry out the law of the land. I want you to arrest us for fishing outside the regulation. And one of the reasons was all the people were cooperating said, well, why are we cooperating? Why are we fishing within the regulation when the other bands are not? Why should we uh, cooperate with them and abide by the law when we have three bands who says we don't care. We're going to go and fish what we want when we want. So it, I think I was in a difficult position. And if I hadn't done that, it would have been very difficult. So. Uh, the deputy minister always did not want to do that. In the final analysis, I said to him, I'm the minister, and I'm instructing you as minister. I want you to send out enforcement. I want you to arrest people who are not abiding by the freedom And that was a very, very strong move on my part uh, as a minister. But the buck stops on my desk. And it's interesting, the deputy minister says, well, minister, this is such a, an important issue we have to consult the Prime Minister. Uh, and I said, well, uh, you said you're entitled to do that. But unless I get a call from the Prime Minister, my decision will stay. And we did go to the next night. We arrested people. We charged people. Uh, it was probably one of the sleepless nights I had as a minister. Because I said, if anybody's hurt, I want you to call me right away. And fortunately, one of our person who was in the fisheries officers was hurt and broke his jaw during the time when we tried to arrest him. Some of the people, but other than that, we didn't, didn't have it. But I think there was a clear message that I had to send out that we have to have law and order, we have to have an orderly fishery, and we have to make sure that uh, everybody complies. Eventually, the same group signed an agreement later on with the next fisheries minister, basically providing the same uh, agreement which I was providing at the time. So now, roll back, that sort of gives you sort of the, the background of, of what happened. And now if you look back now, uh, there's, a, there's a report right here that I've got that you may want to look at. And uh, it's very interesting because at that time, nobody thought we'd ever be successful in integrated fishery. And it says that a policy rag, rags to riches story that's good news for Aboriginals and for Canada. So what happened was, once we started getting the cooperation, I was able to get the budget through a very difficult fight with my colleagues. The funds were in place. Uh, we developed the program, first of all, to buy licenses on a reverse auction, those who wanted to sell. So we had capacity. So we have a situation now where people who are fighting against each other were ready to shoot each other. Now we're working together. And uh, the commercial fishermen are now engaging in mentoring and training these people. They have the skills. We didn't want to say, here's a boat, see you later. We didn't want to give them nets, see you later. We said, we're going to be there to make sure you have a successful venture. And one of the examples given in this new study done shows that uh, the economic development in some of these communities, like Eskasoni, they went from providing $3 million in revenue to their community to $10 million. Uh, 
uh, for the whole fishing of the Atlantic, for the First Nations, they went uh, from four or five million dollars to thirty-five million dollars in economic development, a tenfold income. So it's it's a really good story for Canada uh, that we could integrate the First Nations into the fishery, and now they're successful, they're trained, they're out there running their boats. <coughs> we made sure that we didn't just have them lease their licenses. They had to fish the license themselves. And some of them found it was pretty hard work and they didn't want to do it. So now we created a program that was attuned to their specific needs in the area in which they were, developed a long-term program, provided them with the tools, provided them with the training, provided them with the mentoring so they could be successful in fishing ventures. And that, that's what we have now. That's why you don't read a lot about it, because uh, basically it's, 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 a, it's a big success story of incorporating the First Nations uh, in, into the fishery. Uh, but it, was, it just didn't happen on its own. There was a lot of people involved. In fact, it's still going on today after uh, 12 years. There's still a program now that continues to integrate First Nations into the fishery where they want to on a volunteer basis. And that, that continues today. Now, the, the one thing that I, I really learned from this whole thing was that, you know, when the Supreme Court ruling came out, everybody said it was a disaster. The Supreme Court didn't know what they're doing. We're not gonna, it's not going to work. There's a good example where politically it would not have been possible for me as a cabinet minister to go to my cabinet colleague and say, I need $750 million because for economic development, it would be great to incorporate and bring in the First Nations of the fishery. It would not be possible. I'd be laughed out of the cabinet table. No one would help me. But the Supreme Court, by making it the law of the land, forced the system. It forced the system where it made us come together. It made us bring together policy, develop policy that has helped. And one of the best things you can do as a minister is improve the lives of marginalized communities. It's the most rewarding. And that's why I say this file is, was the most difficult. You know, it was most difficult because I had to make some tough decisions. Uh, and yet it was most rewarding. And I, used, I had a chief from, from Big Island come to me and say, Minister, our suicide rate is dropping. I had chief saying, just in tears, saying, but now you've given us hope that people are working, they're developing skills. And so there's a huge change now. Uh, even though even those uh, bands who were not happy, I think they would say today, that they're much better off today and, uh, than they were because of the things that were done at the time, which continues to be done now. So it is, it is a good story for Canada. And it's a good story that, you know, the, there's some things that politically we cannot do. It's too difficult. Politics gets in the way. And sometimes there's an old story that, you know, good policy isn't always good politics, and good politics isn't always good policy. And so uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a different, it's not, it's not that easy to do because of the, the political, but the Supreme Court has helped us to do it. Now, I'll give you one other example that happened in another country which is very similar. That the Supreme Court has helped them. Uh, if any of you have visited New Delhi, it was, it was an extremely polluted city. And uh, one Supreme Court judge had the courage to say that under the right to life in the Indian Constitution, uh, you, I want you to convert all the taxis and buses into natural gas, CNG, compressed natural gas. So the judge had the courage to say, I will not allow vehicles that are not on CNG. Everybody says, this judge is a crazy nutcase. The chief minister of New Delhi said, this judge is an idiot. We have no infrastructure. We have no infrastructure. And she was called in contempt of court. And uh, eventually the judge did not charge her. But now they have CNG stations everywhere. They have vehicles converted and it's improved the health of Delhi. But politically, it would have been impossible for someone to do that and say that. Because for the first three months, there were five hour lineups to get CNG. And people would have been outraged if anybody tried to say that. 
So I think at the end of the day, Supreme Court uh, did the country a favor in making this landmark ruling to force us as a society and as a political group to, to deal with it. So I hope that, that, that uh, gives you a good understanding and now I'll open up to questions on any, any, any question. It doesn't have to be one or anything else. Any questions you may have. Okay, we've got half an hour for a piece of lots of questions. Yeah. Please ask. Don't be shy. Yes? Have you, do you follow um, the recent developments in the fisheries world? The law cases, the Lux Palons and the Ahousek cases? The what? The Lux Palons and the Ahousek cases? No, I, I mean, I don't follow it as much as I used to, of course. I mean, I, I, my comments earlier was I'm, I was disappointed with the changes to uh, the habitat protection, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is very regrettable. The cuts to the resources to the fisheries in, in, in protecting habitat. You know, any, anybody in the, in the fisheries business know if you want to protect the species, you have to protect the habitat. It's fundamental. If you don't protect the habitat, you're going to you're going to destroy the species. So, you know, this, this view that uh, you don't have to protect the habitat or only protect the habitat of those species that are, uh, are, are commercially targeted is, I think, wrong-headed, and, and science doesn't support it. Science is you have to protect the habitat, and you have to manage on an ecosystem basis. You know, we've learned that over here. You have to manage by the ecosystem, not just by the species. And I think it's a huge mistake that this government is making, and, uh, my, not only myself, uh, other federal ministers in the conservative government, we've all come together to write to them and say, this is wrong-headed. It's not the right way to go, and we'll pay a price for it down the line. And now with the shutdown of the research center in Ontario, too, there again, I think, you know, just uh, not a belief in science and moving towards ideology as opposed to science. I think good decisions have to be based on science, not on ideology. Um, I was just wondering why you decided to um, buy out the quotas rather than just reallocating all of the individual quotas okay. um, in order to... Good question. Well, the reason is the, the, the quotas are fully allocated already. Okay. So there's no quotas left. So the pie is already full. You cannot create another pie because as soon as you add onto that quota, the other people are going to say, well, hold it, you're taking away from us. This is our livelihood because you're creating another pie. And, and, and there's only a limited number, so you have to take away from someone. If your total allowable catch is the pie, and now you're going to expand that, first of all, people will say, well, you know, you remember your total allowable catch was wrong if you're going to expand it. Second of all, uh, if you've already allocated all of it, the only way to get it back is by the license that exists now. I guess I just mean, why didn't you just re reduce everyone's piece? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, we didn't reduce everybody's piece because just imagine if you're the commercial fisherman, you paid for this license, you put money into it, you have a quota for it, now you're going to say, you're actually reducing my quota, which I paid for through the purchase of this license for 100000 or 200000 even though you know the federal government provides a license without that value, but it gains uh, artificial value out there. So the license is valued on the base on what your allowable catch is, and if you take that away, uh, you people are very angry because you're basically taking away part of the land. You and and uh, we would have had huge social unrest. I think there's a problem with your logic. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that the First Nations fishery was exclusive before the non-Aboriginal fisheries ever existed for a very long time. And so when you're talking about people being very angry about the fisheries moving to the other side, it's problematic. Secondly, I think that there's also a misinformation about Aboriginal rights in the first place. Um, we were talking about treaties. You have to remember what the treaties were about and what they were for. And uh, most of uh, what I'm familiar with, our treaties were to grant rights from the Aboriginal community to non 
native people, colonists, to settle, generally to share the resources. So, and that, and that was agreed upon on many, on many counts of the treaty. So, and the treaties are under the foundation of the doctrine of discovery, which is a racist type of thing, uh, international law. So, when you're talking about the Supreme Court granting rights, it really wasn't the Supreme Court granting the rights. I would say that instead of allocating, um, and I think what you did is what you did, fine to a certain degree, but a bigger point would have been uh, trying to work out a co where you have Aboriginal communities developing their expertise in fisheries and to co with the federal government instead of the paternal aspect that you have, the DFO, and, and I understand it's because of the Fisheries Act and all these other things. So, from my perspective, I think it's flawed, and uh, and I would be pushing more for uh, co-management or equal, because the foundation of the country is was established that way. There were co-managements. Part of the part of the response to Marshall was also co-management with the Aboriginal So part of the program was to co-manage. But you know the, the question the question you ask is. Is, was beyond my area because it was the treaty negotiation with yes. the Minister of Aboriginal. And, and I understand what you're saying, but for, the, for my mandate as the Minister of Fisheries, and that part of it, they had a separate organization to do treaty negotiation under the ministry. My job as a minister, and I only speak from as Minister of Fisheries, is to how to integrate. So those larger questions and, and uh, uh, those are some of the issues that, uh, through the treaty negotiations, they have to address. Uh, and, 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 and you're very much right that, you know, we don't know. They have to work that out. But it wasn't part of what I, my response was as fisheries minister. It was part of treaty negotiations, which could take, you see, the, my problem was, those negotiations could years take years and years and years, okay, or decades, right? My job was to try to respond as quickly as possible. And those negotiations are still going on today and will continue to go on. You know, we'll, we've got a huge amount of effort, lawyers, and treaty negotiators so trying to deal with that larger issue. Of, of, uh, because, you know, you could argue that forestry, mining, all these other resources are also part of the same realm. So this, that was a much larger issue and bigger issue that I could not, nor did I have the mandate to deal with. But you're absolutely right, those issues that. What, what portion of the Lally fishery is allocated to Aboriginal people? Well, I think, uh, are you talking about before Marshall or after Marshall? Well, you can, get a, you can do it before and after. Well, I, like I said, there's a huge change that's happened now. I think uh, probably you were talking, I mean, it depends. I mean, under the, under the Sparrow decision, as you know, uh, it said that you know, First Nations could fish for ceremonial and food purposes. And that was the only area. Uh, it was only after Marshall and Atlantic Canada that they could do for commercial. I mean, I, I don't think it can't be more than 3 to 5%. I, mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact figure. But uh, now I think it would be substantially more. Maybe 4, 5, 6 times more. I, know there, I, I was reading the report that was done here, and it showed that you know, there's a 10 times improvement in terms of the revenue from 3 million to over 40 million, to 37 million. So there's been a big improvement in terms of uh, the, the Aboriginal members involved in the So Marshall has made a hit, big difference. I think it was very small before. But you know, what is the exact figure? I don't know. And how do you compare Pacific to the Atlantic in terms of our approach to managing fisheries? and the rule for Aboriginal communities and fisheries. The there, there has been a slow progress mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, bringing versus into the fishery, uh, going way back even before myself as a fishery. But in my, my, my judgment, you know, a lot more has to be done. The problem was the government's winning with the funds that are needed to do it because, in my point of view, economic development, uh, 
one of the areas where we have a huge opportunity in the future for the first nation. And I don't think we ever put the financial resources in a big way because when you start talking about five hundred million or a billion dollars, as if you got to, if you want to buy people out of the industry to give a piece of that pie, it's very expensive. And that's the way we did it. We needed large amounts of money, and governments are not always willing to make a commitment. And that's, I think, one of the mistakes that governments have made. As someone who said, you know, was pushing to say, we need to have $10 billion over 10 years to make sure that we help First Nations across this country. That that's the type of commitment, long-term commitment, large funds. And that was part of what the Kelowna Accord was all about, was the French or federal. But uh, then, you know, governments, the next government didn't want to do it, which I think was a big mistake because there's huge social costs for a country that we have because we're not dealing with some of those situations in you know, terms economic development, uh, education. So I think it's a mistake not having a long-term plan to deal with it. And I, and I you know, even for my own government, we didn't, we didn't do enough. Uh, Post allocation of these licenses to the Aboriginal community. <laughs> Um, do you see a movement at all towards uh, rent cap rent? People, trying to prepare, people who receive the quotas then selling them back to the original commercial fishermen? Yeah. Or did most of them say in the community? We did not allow that. I mean, the one thing we wanted to be careful, we didn't want to give these uh, allocations and then have them sold or have them leased. So we specifically said they would have to use the license, they would have to be on the boat, they would have to do the fishing. They couldn't just lease it up, even though at the beginning, we had to hire, we had to hire people to support them because this was new to some of them. Sure, they would, they would throw a trap in your bike to actually have a boat, manage the boat, keep the maintenance of the boat, maintaining the nets, all those things was new. So this is a, we tried to bring the two communities together to cooperate. And so the, this could not be done because, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it wouldn't serve the purpose because we were trying to create a long-term economic development. Was that a permit policy or was it allowed in the future for the cap and trade policy to kind of work its way out for those um, contracts to re-enter the market? Any, any, as far as I know, unless it's changed, any license that we provide belong to that band. Then they would allocate to their uh, individuals or allow them to use it. So it's not something that can be sold or traded or leased or rented. They have to uh, deal with it. And they've done with it very successfully. All the reports that have done and extremely successful. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Yoshota. I work at the Fisheries Center. I have a question sure. more about uh, pipeline. Yeah. Really. Um, where do you actually see the policy gap to advance um, whatever the government or, or corporate would like to do in the fairest way or more yeah. sustainable way? Well, I mean, I mean, generally speaking, uh, we have pipelines all over this country. <laughs> right? So, uh, in terms of the environment, actually, we've done a pretty good job. There are, there are areas that, that, that we, I think the response was not as we would all want. Uh, but there are a lot of pipelines that have new oil in this country and new gas. I mean, one of the reasons we have a good standard of living is we have gas piped into our houses. You know. uh, so I'm not one who's against pipeline, but we have to make sure it meets a hurdle of uh, meeting the environmental requirements. You know, we, 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 we can't uh, build pipelines and find a huge environmental problem. So it has to meet that hurdle. If it meets the environmental hurdle, uh, whether it's uh, the gateway pipeline, if it meets those environmental hurdles we have to have, uh, I, I'm not against, per se, building a pipeline because they're everywhere in this country. And it's created a good standard of living for all of us. But we have to meet the environmental uh, hurdles. It might be a bit difficult to ask, but who do you think should make the hurdle? Who should write? Who should make the hurdle? Um, who should make the hurdle? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Scientist? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's under federal jurisdiction when you have interprovincial pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the province should have a say. I mean, I, I think uh, if it goes through the province, they have to fully consult with the provinces. From a legal legal point of view, interprovincial pipelines are the jurisdiction of the federal government. But you know, it should be done in conjunction and consulting with the province. Thank you. Well, 
that's a good question, and, and people's thinking changed. If you remember the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, the Aboriginal community didn't want the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline either. That was when we had, uh, right, almost 25, 30 years ago, we had the first time to do a study, and uh, they didn't want it, but there was a huge change later on that they did want the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline to access all the gas of the north. Uh, and also, uh, First Nations also want some sort of benefit for it too. They're looking for some benefits, economic benefit as well. And I think uh, if environmentally it can be done, then the, the Aboriginal communities can, can benefit from that. They'll be more willing to go along. But if there's no benefit for them, and there's environmental problems, and uh, they maybe hurt their livelihood, of course they don't want to be a part of it, and they don't want to uh, participate in it. And I think one of the problems with the gateway pipeline is I think the government was just so aggressive that this is going to happen no matter what. And people said, well, no. And so I think the way it was handled, it was totally mishandled. Instead of letting our, 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 our systems like the National Energy Board to go out and do the hearings and let them make a decision, the government sort of was very happy to have and said, this is going to happen. We don't care what anybody says. So now I think they've got a more difficult problem now as to what, at the end of the day, they can make a decision. And it's very hard, I think, to push that through without the cooperation of the province and without the cooperation of, of the First Nations. You know, I think there's a huge uh, uh, problem in going through on that. Yes? itself has a nominal value, but over the years it's developed a value uh, through the industry. So people who say, well, I paid 250000 for my license, I'm not going to accept anything less than my share of the total value. Right. So uh, a lot of that is already precedent. There's already precedent that's set up. But if you want to have new allocation, in the end it's, it's the minister responsible why he signs off. Uh, as long as you stay within that total allowable catch. But if someone's been fishing this for years and years and years, you can't all of a sudden take it away from them. You know, you can reduce everybody's, but you can't take individuals from the total, the total of the total allowable catch. So a lot of it is, uh, uh, is really looking at historic what's happened, what's allowable catch, and what people caught before, and based on what they saw. The total number of bands uh, of the of the Maliseet and the was 34. But some of them were never involved in the fishery, nor were they area, so they didn't. They weren't really in contention. There was really uh, about 30, 30, 29 to 30 that were really involved in fishing. At this time, all of them who are involved in fishery have signed an agreement and are fishing according to the law. So there, we don't have that problem. Otherwise. You see it in the paper. So it's been a very successful program where all the bands have participated, all of them have agreements, all of them have been allocated resources to help them 
integrate in the fishery and be a part of the fishery. us as paying too much to the government, but we had to go in this program. And there were people who wanted to get out, so we gave them an opportunity to get out. And also the reverse auction helped us to get the best price. <coughs> but these are tradable. That's what I think. Even though when they got the license 15 years ago, there was no value. But over the years, this trade didn't develop a value. We have to respect that. <coughs> Thank you very much. You have a good evening.